Chapter 19 Can you fly this thing? asked Craig Peterson as he watched Tam's land dial look over the controls. Just give me a minute. Everything that flies has to have lift. I just need to find the controls for this one. Suddenly, the ship came to life and the instruments lit up. What did you do? asked Jennifer Haynes as she stepped upside one of Craig's seats. I didn't do anything. It just woke up, I guess, Captain Thomas Landau said as the ship began lifting off the ground. The cave in which the troop had traveled was set far below the Earth's surface. All that was present aboard the ship looked out the small windows along the sides of the magnificent vessel. I have a theory, said Colonel Mike Maines. The creatures we have captured over the years have been humanoid with alien mechanics implanted in them. They had no free moving ability. They were like puppets. This stands to reason that they could not fly their own vessels. So you're saying someone is controlling this thing remotely? Asked Jennifer. Yes, they probably have these things buried all over the planet until they are needed and they call them to duty. The sun began illuminating the crew overhead as the massive doors opened to reveal the sky. The giant ship started lifting straight up into the air. Where do you think this thing is taking us? Asked Craig as he sat, clutching the sides of his seat. I have no idea, said the colonel. The old brick building began to shake. What did you do? Rudy asked as he watched the debris falling all around the ship. The ship was much smaller than the others. It was designed to move in and out of battle at incredible speeds. It appeared to be a jet, but the controls inside looked nothing like Tim had seen. Did you start this thing up? asked Rudy as he looked down from the rear seat. Bricks and mortar began bouncing off the canopy without so much as scratching the surface. I did not do anything. The ship just woke up, Tim said as he tried running his fingers over the touchpad set in front of him on the console of the fighter. Well, the ship is doing something, Rudy said almost in panic as the ship began lift from the ground. Well, I guess we'd better hang on and see where it takes us, Tim added as he removed his fingers from the console. Paul Boring sat trying to figure out how the enormous vessel he and his fellow prisoners had confiscated from the aliens. We freed the rest, said Lester Fremont. As he walked into the vessel's control room, suddenly the ship took a hard turn. Suddenly everyone gathered in the room to one side. What are you doing? asked one of the former prisoners as he grasped a seat back, steady himself. I'm not doing anything. The ship just turned. The other passengers began looking at one another. What on earth could be happening? One of them was heard saying. Well... The aliens could have realized we've taken control of their ship, and they decided to override the system and lead us into a trap, Paul said as he was still trying to figure out the controls. I suggest everyone try and find something to use as a weapon, in case they try and board us. The old tanks fired their cannon at the alien ship as it made their killing approach. Bring that cannon up here, the sergeant shouted from atop one of his tanks. The young soldier hurried to try and bring the cannon made by Dr. Vish to the front line. The alien jets set down a spray of lead that sent the troops for cover. The young private stopped in his tracks as he watched several friends get mowed down by the onslaught of the flying death machines. Fire that thing, son! General Flagg yelled as another wave of lead fell hard on the troops. Then, without warning, Mary grabbed the cannon from the young man's shaking hands and aimed it at one of the attacking planes. The cannon fired electronic stream that sent the alien ship careening into the side of the mountain. She aimed again and came up with the same result. The desert was now full of men and women as they fought. The aliens had no ground forces yet. They only had their jets to hold the attack. However, the aliens showed no fear as they knew reinforcements were coming soon. The sergeant kept his unit tight. The men and women were firing at the ships as they made their passes overhead. Many of the soldiers had been left in the wake, lying in the sand. Most were killed instantly. Others died slowly. The sergeant lifted his binoculars to see Clint's team coming from the other side of the hill behind the enemy compound. It's about time, he said to no one in particular. Inside the enemy compound, the aliens were scrambling. Should we take up the ships now, my lord? Asked the subordinate to his master. These ships are our reserves. And besides, this is the last stand for these pitiful humans. We have won this planet, 
the leader said as he tapped a few keys on his handheld pad. Beside, it won't be long till we get the ground forces here. Then it will be all over, even quicker. Clint's team came into the fight virtually unnoticed by the alien army. They fired at the ships from behind and saved hundreds, almost killed by another onslaught of ammunition about to rain down on Sergeant Kine's men. Over there, look! While Bill Monroe shouted as he continued to fire the cannon the Dr. Vish had made, Clint looked up to the sky from the driver's seat of the jeep. Oh no, they have called in reinforcements. Oh dear lord, look at that, Craig said as he continued to clutch the alien vessel's passenger seat. Those are our guys, Clarence Millhorn said as he peered out from the window that sat alongside the ship. Are we going to fight our own guys? asked Ralph Rogers. Not if I can help it, Thomas says he began frantically running his fingers over the controls. I need to find an override on this thing. They're bringing in reinforcements, Sergeant Hernandez shouted from the tank as she poked her head out to get a clearer view of the battle. Mary, shoot those things down, shouted the sergeant. The battle raged, blood spilled everywhere. The sergeant's army was depleted from nearly 300 to 150, including Clint's soldiers, but nobody wanted to give up. They had to win this battle. They had to win this for their race. Inside the enemy compound, a spy sat quietly in the darkened corner of the room. He had kept himself hidden behind some operating tables. He peered up on occasion, but then slowly knelt down. When the door would open and close, he would peer out to see the beasts as they came and went, all the while leaving him unnoticed. He could hear the leader and his aide, but had no idea what they were saying. I have control over the new arrivals. I will begin attack programs now, the lead alien said as he ran his finger over a console, bringing the machine to life with lights and a series of beeping noises. The man, known as Shadow, still listening to the aliens, knew he had to act soon. He reached to his thigh and pulled out an M1911 pistol from its holster. He then stood to his feet, causing both aliens to shake at the appearance. They had not expected the humans to leave a man behind. What happened? I don't know, but the controls have been released, shouted Tim as the jet continued its descent to attack the human army. Tim then grabbed the yoke right before colliding into a tank. What on earth was that? Sergeant Kine said as the jet nearly missed colliding with him. Are they suicide bombing us now? He added as he watched several other jets crash land on the side of the mountains. What's going on? General Flagg said as he watched in amazement at how many of the planes seemed to fall from the skies. They have been released, Mary said as she could read the program running through her system. Shadow stood over the dead alien bodies. His smoking forty-five hung in his hand by his side. He looked to the control pad. It was now black. He felt a jolt beneath the floor of the alien building. Then he felt another, this time overhead. He reached his left hand over to the console. He then touched a few keys on the touchscreen, and the monitor came to life. He watched as his army scattered, trying to avoid falling jets and ships of all shapes and sizes. Then he heard the door behind him open. There! He listened to the creature shout, but this time he could understand what the thing said. Shadow lifted his weapon again. This time, the creature had one of his own. The laser weapon fired at Shadow but he dodged the attack. He lowered his body to the floor and rolled near the medical table. The alien fired another round. This time, the force of the blast knocked the table over, causing Shadow to change positions. He then aimed his own weapon and fired, hitting the first alien in the face. But the second was much quicker and fired a burst of energy. And this time, it hit his mark. Shadow was knocked back against the glass wall that overlooked the enormous ships to be the prize of the human race. He slid to the deck, leaving behind a trail of blood splashed along the glass. He stopped in a sitting position. He then looked down to see the dark area around his abdomen had been scorched by the alien's weapons. He slowly raised his head to see the alien creature as they approached him. Shadow managed to lift his pistol that was still in his hand. He fired twice, killing another alien. But another beast stepped up and shot another blast of energy, killing Shadow where he sat. Don't shoot, we're on your side, Rudy said as he stood from the grounded jet with his hands on the airs. 
Okay, step out of there, Wild Bill said as he kept his Colt forty five revolvers aimed at the two men. Tim stood up next. Where are we? he asked as he looked around all the sand that was now surrounding him. Open up or we start shooting, was the sound as the small band of soldiers began going over every ship that had crash-landed around them. Wait, we are one of you guys, said Craig Patterson as the team as they climbed out of the downed vessel they had been piloting, and yet another voice could be heard from a much larger ship as Paul Boring also led an army of prisoners from their ship. Sergeant Kine had already begun leading a team up to the outpost. When from above, another attack came, but not from the jets disguised to look like a human had built them. No, they were like something from a science fiction movie. They were more rounded, like the classic flying saucers of old alien conspiracy theories. But they had a pointed tail and a nose cone, and moved in and out of the light, making them almost invisible. You, robot, shoot those things down. General Flagg said as he pointed to the saucers. He then turned to face Sergeant Hernandez. Sergeant, go back to the HQ and ready our people for departure. Mary ignored the insult of being called a robot and aimed her cannon to fire. Her new eyes, it seemed, could scan quicker than the machines could fly. As she fired and hit everyone she had aimed at, she wanted badly to grin. Still, her facial muscles would not let her. Meanwhile, Sergeant Kind had made his way to the structure's entrance. He pulled on the door, which came open hard, knocking him backward. Clint then noticed an alien had come out with the door and was wrestling on top of the sergeant. Clint, lead a team, get inside and find a way to fly those ships, General Flagg said as he made his way to Sergeant Kind had now flipped the giant alien creature on its back and was punching the beast about the head and shoulders. Clint stepped inside the alien structure. First, he could see the long metal stair casing that led down and he remembered it well. He walked fast, leading Allie and Wild Bill, John Loomis, Marcus St. John down with him. He reached the landing, his shotgun firmly in hand as he approached the door he knew held the secrets of getting to the ships. It was darker than ever before. He could barely see three feet in front of him, and then he heard something move inside the darkened room. He held up a gloved hand, asking everyone to wait. Oh! shouted John Loomis as he fell to the deck. Allie turned to see one of the creatures on top of the man tearing his flesh apart with its hands, or what she assumed were its hands. She raised her rifle, and then she heard Marcus cry out from her left side. She spun to see another one had seemed to fall from nowhere onto the unsuspecting soldier. He, too, met the fate of John Loomis. She again raised her rifle, but Clint's shotgun blast nearly deafened everyone in the room. The alien's head exploded, and it fell dead on top of Marcus's body. Then he turned to the other one but Bill's forty-five caught the creature's skull this time, sent to the floor surrounded by its own blood. Hurry, we need to get into the control room. Then something landed in front of Clint, causing him to pause and step back. It did not look like an alien. He waited for his eyes to focus, then he recognized the figure of Mary. She had jumped the long drop without a mark to show. Incredible, Bill said before Clint. I can get the ship started. But once they are airborne, it is up to you to figure navigation. I can get you as far as the remote will let me, she said, as she turned to face the control room. The alien was dead, and the sergeant stood to his feet. He was covered in strange-looking fluids from the creature. His military tunic was ripped down the front, and his hat was bent, but unharmed. All right, troops. We need to get inside before more show up. We are taking this base, Sergeant Kind yelled as he held a fist into the air to a round of yells from the hundreds ready to take back their planet.